be called and you can't do it. Uh, it's just, it's a very painful thing. When many of our kids, when they come into Groves um, for the first time, they're looking at the top of their shoes. They're slouched over, their shoulders are slumped, they won't look you in, in the eye, and it's just a really painful thing. And this is a, a, a staggering statistic, and I'll explain why. If by um, the start of third grade, we have not identified kids with a reading problem, and, big and, we have not given them proper forms of intervention, there's only a 25% chance that that student will learn to read at grade level in their public school career or their school career. Now, why is that a big problem? Because the current way we identify students is with a reading problem is that there has to be a gap between their intelligence, their potential, and where they're actually functioning. And the gap has to be of a certain magnitude, about 1.5 standard deviations, for that child to be identified as needing intervention. And by the very nature of it, it takes a few years, right? Because if you're in first grade and you're just learning to read, that gap hasn't grown sufficiently yet. You're not going to be at 1.5 standard deviations until well after third grade. Most of our kids are, aren't identified until fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And by that time, statistically, they're way behind the eight ball. They're way behind. What are some of the ramifications of illiteracy? Well, 43% of Americans with the lowest literacy skills live in poverty, and 70% have no jobs or a part-time job. And conversely, only 5% of Americans with strong literacy skills live in poverty. More ramifications. 75% of unemployed adults have reading or writing difficulties. The link between academic failure and delinquency, violence, and crime is welded to reading failure. U.S. Department of Justice. 70% of inmates in American prisons can't read above the fourth grade level. And maybe this may be the most staggering commentary. There are actually states in the United States in the South that build prisons based on how many, it shouldn't be people are illiterate, but how many middle school students are illiterate. That's how they're projecting prison growth, the middle school illiteracy. So what do we need to do to ensure that that those 95% of instructional casualties are no longer instructional casualties. Well, these are the characteristics of, of good reading instruction. That it's direct and explicit, it's sequential and systematic, it's multi-sensory, and it's developmentally appropriate from a meta aspect, from a, a child's ability, where he is uh, in, the, in the cognitive maturation process. So what are the four components of a, of a literacy framework? Now this literacy framework that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the night is a literacy framework that I've been kind of developing over a, a period of, of, of years and then finally last year I felt good enough about it that we implemented it here at Groves and I'll show you at the end of this presentation some of the results of that. And we're also exporting this right now, this same literacy framework is in a charter school of high-risk kids in Minneapolis. We're in year two of a three-year uh, pilot pro uh, project with them, and we got very, very good uh, results in year one. We've also taken this uh, components of this framework and worked in a Minneapolis public school uh, two years ago, three years ago, and got very good results as well. So the very first component of it is quality core instruction. Making sure that that reading curriculum that's being used is evidence-based, <coughs> that it's not um, being sold to the school uh, by a publisher that has no uh, evidence behind it, has no research behind it. And along with that quality core instruction, uh, teachers need to be trained in how to use that curriculum. It's also uh, 
you have to have database decision making. We have to objectively look at how kids are doing. It's not a subjective, I think Billy's doing really well and we had a really good week. But it's looking at data, objective data, to help us inform instruction, make thoughtful decisions about the curriculum and how we use it. Third, uh, we want to use a response to intervention model, and I'll get into that in a, in a minute. And finally, we have to have time for professional collaboration. So if something isn't working, <coughs> looking at the data and seeing that a child isn't making an adequate rate of progress, we have to have time as educators to sit down and figure out what's going on, why isn't that child making progress, what do we need to do to intervene to make sure that they catch up. There has to be time for that. So the five strands of reading, uh, which I think drew you here tonight, and which I'm really talking um, as part of the bigger picture, are phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And I'll talk a little bit about each and then how we integrate it into a program, uh, a literacy program. So phonemic awareness, very simply, is a child or anybody's <coughs> ability to sequence and segment um, and manipulate the sounds of a word. So we're not even, don't even think about print. This is just a spoken word. So a child in the middle of first grade should be able to tell us that cat is comprised of how many distinct speech sounds? Three, right? K, k, at, okay. But we don't go, for efficiency's sake, we don't go around saying at. It's, it, it comes across as one pulse, cat, but a child has to be able to dissect that because if you can't tell me that, three, that there are three speech sounds in the word cat, it becomes very difficult to overlay <coughs> an abstract representation, a letter, to that sound. And not only can, should he be able to tell me that it's three sounds, if I say, Billy, take the word cat and take the first sound away, what do you have left? Billy should be able to tell me at. Okay? So that's what phonemic awareness is. Just the ability to hear, segment, and manipulate sounds found within words. And it's really, uh, this is a, Hold on to this slide because at the very end of this uh, presentation, I'm going to give you something that you're going to have to rely on this slide. So it's really important to understand that speech sounds and orthographic systems are different. Okay, so the orthographic system is the spelling system we use to represent speech sounds. And one's a, an auditory system, a speech sound system is auditory. The orthographic system is a visual system. Okay, and unless teachers can distinguish speech sounds and teach them both in isolation and when co-articulated, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to convey this understanding to students. And again, we're going to come back to this at the end of this presentation. So how do you teach phonemic awareness? Well, there are lots of different ways. One thing that can be done and I apologize for a cat and city being here, but uh, we can take children at you know five, six, seven years old, and just play with with uh, colors like this. So I could say to a, a child, um, Billy, this is the sound. K. Can you show me the sound? K? So Billy will say, K. and I'll say, good. So Billy, this is the sound. Ah. Can you show me the sound ah? So Billy will pull down the blue and say ah. And then I'll say, Billy, this represents t. Can you show me t? And he'll bring this down and say t. And I'll say, that's great, Billy. Now, can you spell the word cat? So Billy will go k, ah, t. So he's just manipulating sounds. And I'll say, that's great. Can you spell tack? So he'll go t, a, k. And when we do this over and over and over again until this is automatic, until they can manipulate the sounds of words, and we're going to go, you know, from 
from one sound to two sounds to three sounds. Then I might you know, introduce a blend, so maybe this is plat, at, and he has to manipulate those sounds. Um, we'll do this over and over and over again until that sound structure is automatic. And we always, for these kids who have reading to, and let me just say too, that good reading instruction is good reading instruction. So it doesn't matter if you're the most severely dyslexic kid in the world or you're Mary the overachiever.